Hello, young people of the internet. Welcome back to another episode of Bright and Early from the team at the Bill of Rights Institute. My name is Rachel Davison Humphreys. I'm Director of Outreach here at the Institute. And we're so glad you're joining us this week. I'm here with my colleagues, Kirk and Gary. Kirk. How is everybody doing? Doing okay. You know, I'm finding myself trying to keep productive. Exactly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, it's been a little while since we spoke to you and we've all been figuring out what work means in our homes and how to organize our lives. And we've been thinking about what we often think about, which is how do we turn to those in history to help us think through how to organize ourselves and be better people. So first, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Ben Franklin. So I don't know how much you know about Ben Franklin already, but he was someone who was very interested in developing himself and becoming a better person, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. Sometimes the people who are most interested in improving themselves are those that recognize that they have the most to improve. And so Ben Franklin was this incredibly productive person. If you don't know much about him, I mean, if there is full of a person in American history who contributed the most to civil society, I'd make a strong argument for Ben Franklin. Um, what do you think, Kirk? Yeah, I think he's certainly up there. And, you know, I think he's interesting also in that he was not, he was very much a businessman and an inventor first, right? As many of the founders wore lots of different hats, Franklin was no different, um, but he was also um, of sort of another generation older than a lot of the founders as well, which is interesting. But but I've been thinking about Franklin a lot because, you know, frankly, no pun intended, uh, you know, it, structuring my day has become sort of odd. I usually have, uh, you know, an office to go to, or I have chores to go do, or or go out and uh, meeting friends or whatever. And that whole world has been kind of disrupted. So I don't know about you guys, but I've really been trying to add structure to my day. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've experienced that too. You know, there is something about knowing you have to be at a certain place that the structure comes from the outside. And I think one of the big things is it's okay for the structure to come from the inside. You know, like I'm going to take exercise as an example. Doesn't look like I do it, but I used to take classes that started and ended at very specific times and kind of was a big part of my day. And now, you know, I'm finding myself still wanting to do it, but having to fit it in. And so then the whole day has to become something you structure. And then I ended up doing that, much like Franklin, and this is genuinely something I do, kind of took a look at what was I already doing and then where can I kind of fit things in. So um, the reason I knew about that, honestly, was as a kid, one of the great things about Franklin is he has an autobiography you can read. The autobiography of Ben Franklin was a really, really nice sort of insight into this really brilliant person who did all these things. But I would always flip the, the part in the book for me that's broken is the part about structuring your day. Because even as a kid, I wanted to do it. And we have this really amazing opportunity right now um, in our lives to kind of think about what structure means for us. Like, what is structuring our day look like? And so people have been using Franklin for for, cent for more than a century to think about how to structure their days, um, even as recently as, you know, the modern era, the life hacker website shows some of his best productivity hacks and really dives a little bit into how he thought about his day. He gave himself lists of things he wanted to improve, whether those were the virtues he wanted to exhibit or the, the way he wanted to structure his day. And what's the opportunity that exists right now for all of you is that there's very few outside pressures on how to structure your day. I mean, one of the things that we as is that, you know, kids getting up at six o'clock in the morning is not always the best thing for teenagers, right? So what does it look like when you are able to structure your own day for how you get your work done. A lot of schools are experimenting with online education and asking young people to only come at certain times of the week. So the question is, how do you create the discipline in yourself to, to, to get the things done that you need to? And so this is, again, another great website called Brain Pickings. It's a fun one to poke around in if you've never, never been to it. But they have this wonderful visual diagram of famous authors and when they chose to wake up and how productive they were. And you can see from all these different authors, Edith Wharton, Kurt Vonnegut, Roger Ebert, uh, Goethe, Dickens, Darwin, 
Um, that there was no one way to do this for this famous authors. It's about what works for you. And we have this opportunity, which doesn't come along in life very often, to really take stock and think about what's important and think about how we want to arrange ourselves and our, and our days. Um, and that's all happening because we're in this moment that, you know, can be a little stressful and can feel a little isolated. And one of the ways that uh, we've often dealt with isolation as societies is we've turned inward to find what our strengths are. And so Kirk has been thinking a bit about sometimes in history when we're isolated or when different groups have been isolated. Um, and so he's going to talk to us a little bit about Winston Churchill. Yeah. So thanks, Rachel. I was thinking about, um, you know, how it is that, that we experience these sort of historical events and, um, you know, Franklin was very much someone who was, who was very much conscious that he was a historical figure. And I think part of his process there is, uh, working to improve himself in certain ways and then tracking that over time, which is interesting. Um, Churchill had some quirks, uh, a lot of quirks. He's a very interesting person if you've never heard about him. But um, I was thinking about Churchill because Churchill was became the prime minister of Britain uh, at a time of crisis um, in, uh, in 1940. And uh, he had for years been warning about this Nazi menace throughout the 1930s. Um, and then in 1940, um, you know, he finds himself in the seat of power. And uh, France was invaded by Nazi Germany in uh, May 10th of 1940 is when Germany launched their invasion. And um, France at the time uh, was the most powerful army in the world. They were the largest army in the world. Uh, they were a force to be reckoned with. Um, and by June, that whole country had been nearly overrun, uh, and the British had their backs against the English Channel and were um, their forces um, were their surrounded forces were a town called Dunkirk, um, which is in Belgium. And uh, Churchill put a call out to uh, the people of Britain to help evacuate. Over a thousand ships went across the English Channel uh, to ferry back and forth uh, uh, men and munitions and material to get them off the beach. Um, and that started on May 26th. They began that, uh, that evacuation. Um, and by June 4th, it had been completed. And so Churchill um, wanted to communicate to the nation what had happened and how, um, and reassure them of what was going on, much like our leaders are doing today, getting, getting in front of us. And like we talked about um, before with Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Great Depression. Um, and so he gives this amazing speech um, on June 4th. Um, and he does a few things. I think it's interesting uh, for us to sort of put on our historian hats and think about what he's doing in this speech. So not only what is he communicating, uh, but that context is really important. And then the tools he uses in the speech are really interesting to me. And there's something that I've been sort of listening to um, with different uh, public leaders as well. And so I'll read a couple things from Churchill and then I'll maybe compare those a little bit. Um, so one of the things he does th that I love about Churchill is he's He's very upfront about what's taking place. So he's not trying to hide anything. Um, you know, they just evacuated 330,000 men um, off the beaches in Dunkirk. Um, but he says, we must be very careful not to assign this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuations, right? So he's not saying, hey, well, isn't this amazing? Look at this, we pulled off this incredible thing. But he's saying, hey, let's hold our horses here. Um, you know, this wasn't, you know, totally about just us. Um, and then he also does something where he puts the audience in the center of it. Um, and his concluding paragraph is beautiful. He says, I have myself full confidence that if all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and if the best arrangements are made as they're being made, we shall prove ourselves once again able to defend our island home, to ride out the storm of war, and to outlive the menace of tyranny, if necessary for years, if necessary alone. I was thinking about that today. Larry Hogan, who's uh, the Maryland governor, um, gave an address uh, ordering uh, individuals to, to stay at home um, during this pandemic. Um, and he said that every Marylander has an opportunity to be a hero in and of themselves, right? Um, and it's interesting the way that our political leaders position us um, as a part of the narrative that's taking place, particularly in self-government or situations where self-government occurs, but that we are all a part of this too, and that we all can contribute. Um, one of the ways is like we were talking about, by structuring our day. Um, but another way is, you know, in, in volunteering and in, in giving back to our communities, um, which is important. And here, um, Churchill was calling on the people to, to have resolve, right? And, and they took resolve, I think, from his um, clear vision and, and clear desire uh, to continue to, to, to carry on the fight and defend themselves against um, Nazi tyranny, which 
by this point, they were alone in the world almost um, facing off against this threat. So um, anyway, fun little detour, but I encourage all of you to, to look at um, Churchill's speech from June 4th and, and just to see how it is that he's playing with the audience, how he's, how he's addressing his audience, who he's talking to, um, and in what ways um, he's using that to really coalesce his message. And the other way too is how he's positioning that struggle within sort of the overall struggle of, of British history, um, I think is all really interesting. And those three, those three aspects of rhetoric, right? You have the logic, you have the ethos, and you have the pathos. The great leaders are really, and the great orators, the great speech makers, know how to use each of those levers in really particular ways. And so as we're thinking about how we're communicating with our family and friends, how we're providing solace and consolation, how we're supporting those that need support, thinking about those three different levers. How are we using the arguments and the logic? How are we using our emotional appeal? Um, and how are we using what we bring to the table as an individual um, in those conversations is a really powerful thing to be aware of. Uh, it's sometimes hard to be aware of it in the moment though. So there are these tools that you can use to help you do that. There's a fancy word for it called metacognitive processing. Um, sometimes, I'm just going to call it thinking about what you said or did. <laughs> um, and one of the things, so my colleague Gary has been with the Bill of Rights Institute over a year now. One of the things that I admire greatly about Gary is Gary knows how to create systems and habits better than anyone else that I know. Um, and so he's been doing it for a long time and testing out different theories about how to create a better self. Um, so Gary, tell us what you're going to talk to us about today. Oh, you're being very nice out there, but uh, but thanks. Yeah, no, uh, everything we're discussing today really connects in my mind. You know, you talk about systems and I think, yeah, that's the first thing that happens right after this. I'm going to jot down in my journal these ideas that we um, talked about because I think that's one of those systems, right? So um, you were just talking about the the combination of thinking about thinking, right? I, I like to think of it in terms of reflection. Right, that, that word of you're living through something, how can you reflect back what's happening? But also when Kirk was talking, I was thinking about you know, the power of reaching others through what you say and through what you write, um, but history itself also is reaching across time. So you as students out there, you might have this impulse to wanna connect to other people and you're probably doing it in some way. Um, but connecting with yourself is interesting, the, the, yourself of tomorrow. And that's why I think journaling is really interesting, right? So who knows better than you what your experience is right now? Nobody, right? Your lived experience isn't something, it's not a test answer that you can get right or wrong. It's your lived experience. And so being able to reflect, and I think the most powerful way is to write it down in some journal. Um, get a special one right now, you know, if you don't already have one. Um, Part of the really practical thing that's important is even though if you're not in classes right now, you, in classes you may be really used to taking notes or that kind of thing, you still at some point may want to have some hard answer to the thoughts that you've had. It might even come up soon enough. If some schools are going back to classes virtually, you might be asked over the course of a week to think, what did you think? What did you, what did you experience? And so if you are journaling, you'll have those things to be able to share with others and yourself in the future. Um, I think my advice for that is, is a systemic thing. You gotta give yourself really three things. You have to give yourself some place to write, right? But you also have to give yourself time. I find that having even a set time per day is a really nice time to do it. I'm gonna steal from another resource. Uh, you've talked about resources. I don't know if you're familiar with The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. The you know, artist way is great. And in that, she mentions a, a phrase that can be life-changing, which is morning pages, right? Soon as you wake up, if you have your journal right by your, right by your desk, wherever you're sleeping, spend some time and give yourself, say, 10 minutes. For 10 minutes, I'm just going to write what's going on. You'll be surprised at how powerful that is. And then the third thing, aspect of that, is the thinking of other people. You, you mentioned before self-discipline is part of the structure of the day. We talk about self-governance a lot, and that can mean lots of things. Self-governance could be societal, it could be national, but it can also be personal. And so I think having some sort of 
structure for yourself, even if it's tiny, is so powerful, not only to reach inward and reflect, but to reach outward to others and to reach through time. It's a pretty magical thing. And I think one of the things that we, you know, in modern times, we think a little bit of our social media as our kind of archive of our lives. What we posted on Instagram or what we posted on TikTok or what we posted on Facebook, um, for those of us that are slightly older. Uh, <laughs> it or in old books. <laughs> become, becomes what we, how we think about how we archive our lives. What journaling does is journaling is not outward facing, but inward facing, right? We're selective in what we choose to put on social media because we're, we're not, you know, everyone has a private life and that private life is sometimes very different, sometimes not so different, depending on, on how you're doing and, and what's going on in the world. Um, but what journaling allows you to do is, is really be in touch with that private life. And especially where things are really tumultuous and really un, um, unstable or seem very unstable. What journaling can do is help you just get it out of your head. Right. And that's what Julia Cameron in, in Artist Way talks about the morning pages. She says that it's more if, if you're not familiar, Artist Way is a, is a creativity course that's been extraordinarily successful for decades. And it's based on a book um, and she has you run through a series of exercises. So if you're all interested in creativity, highly recommend this course um, that you can run through yourself. But one of the things that we think about is that we all have these blockages and those blockages exacerbate in times of frustration or times of um, times of tension and so she says get the pages do them first thing in the morning first thing when you get up and you'll get you'll get all that out of your head um, and so what that ends up doing is giving you all these creative ideas for how you can go about your day because you're getting over all these blocks really really early in the day and so whether that's getting your work done in a timely manner, whatever that work may be, or being creative about how you can support your community, journaling can help you start with that kind of creative moment. And then that propels you forward throughout the rest of the day. So um, that's almost all the time we have for our session, for our episode today. Uh, this is the Bill of Rights Institute bright and early. I want to leave you with a couple more activities. Um, so the Bill of Rights Institute does create resources. And one of the resources we've created is one on Ben Franklin and civic virtue. And there's some teacher notes at the front. But if you're if you want a little bit more context for the for Ben Franklin and how he chose to organize himself, this is a really easy entry point with some great questions to consider, maybe that you could journal about. <laughs> um, and then there's actually a journal prompt where it asks you to, to think about why you should try and be the best or perfect. Is perfection attainable? Um, is it what you should be striving for? Like Ben Franklin, um, identify places in your life where it's not perfection, but just improvement and explain why you're looking to do those things. My husband and I have started saying something in our house, which is if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. <laughs> which is helping us overcome some of our um, because there's because doing something poorly means that you've done something otherwise you just don't do anything because you let the perfect be the enemy of the good which yeah. is another kind of phrase that people bandy about a lot yeah one of the things if I can interrupt one of the things I really like about this resource and it really is autobiography I recommend that too if you have some time it's it's a short one despite yeah. a very long life. It's like 120 pages or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is I see that like be like Ben. And what's interesting is if you really read it closely and read that whole resource, it's not if you live his lifestyle and emulate him, but rather grasp how to take a look at your own life. So I think that connects what you were talking about earlier with the different writers and their sleep habits, but also the the deep reading that uh, that Kirk was talking about and, and, and Churchill and, and his approach but also that whole, it's about reflecting on what is good for you, what is working and how can you improve? And it's not be like someone else, but rather to see yourself. And I think that's really cool about the way he writes that. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Kirk. No, I, I was just going to agree and say that in that is sort of the, the, the seeds of, of in, in doing that activity, you're beginning to 
govern yourself because you're thinking about what you're doing and you're being explicit about what you're doing day to day. And it doesn't have to be an odious chore. Um, and it's not something like you got to regiment every five minutes. Um, but, you know, there, there are some benefits just to, to being a little bit more deliberate and a little bit more uh, mindful. And then that brings us back to the helpers and being a helper and, and recognizing that you are a powerful young person with infinite capacity. And that infinite capacity is even more important right now um, because there's so much need and so much opportunity. So it's not that you have to do big, grand, perfect things, but how are you contributing in really small ways to the things you know you can contribute to? Is that something super easy, like putting up a more educational TikTok video or one that helps people feel less isolated, right? Like the real life at home hashtag or the more you know hashtag. Or is that something bigger like Kirk mentioned earlier, um, volunteering, donating blood, doing what it is that your community can do right now um, that you can lead because you have that kind of power and that creativity and that potential. Um, and you have that ability to govern yourself that you don't always have. So on that note, on that exhortation and invitation into civic engagement, we're going to leave you for the day. Um, Gary, Kirk, any kind of last thoughts to the, to the kids for today? No, I think you be you is a, you really, is a really good, good thing. thing. Like look at your day and just be you and see what tomorrow can be. Well, thank you all very much. And I was just going to say, let us know what, what, what you're working on. Let us know what you're thinking yeah. about. Let us know what you, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're comfortable sharing with us. If you have any questions too that you'd like us to explore, we'd, we'd love to have you reach out. Yeah, this is a new experiment for the Bill of Rights Institute. We want to keep doing the bright and early shows, episodes. So we, we're relying on you to give us feedback about what you'd like to hear, what you're thinking about, what you're doing in your communities, what you need more support on, and we'll do our best to try and meet those needs. So thank you all very much. Be well, be safe, be good. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. See ya. See ya.